cube and and we're live on youtube also smile <laughs> all right so the video is live on youtube i'm going to share the link in the community calls channel so that those of you who want to see our face and our faces and our screen can connect up All right, let's see. Aha, turns out I was talking and nobody was hearing me uh, just a few moments earlier. So I was really talking to myself. It happens more often than you will think by accident or just by habit. But uh, anyway, hi everyone on Discord again. So um, we're about to start our community call, um, welcome. We'll start in a few minutes. Today we have the Warp, the Nevermind team presenting Warp. We're also live on YouTube. If some of you want to um, take a look at our screens and what they will have to present, and we will just start in a few seconds. Um, Swap Neil guy, if you want to connect on Discord, that would be wonderful, and then people can hear you. Uh -huh. Join on Discord as well now, I think. I'm sorry? I'm joined on Discord as well, I think now. Yes, I've invited Jorik to speak now. Hello. Hey, Jorik, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Cool. Do -do. So let me check. Swapnil, are you able to connect on Discord also? Yes. Yes. Uh, so you should raise your hand for people to hear you, or let me see if I, I see a hand. Swap OXO. Swapnil. Yeah, makes sense. And we got Guy also. There we are. So there's the four of us here on Discord and we're also here on YouTube. I think we can start. So, okay, let's do it now. Um, so hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this 18th community call. I'm pretty sure we missed one somewhere and there's a missing number, but I'm not sure which one. And, you know, I. Um, so I'm going to count it as 18. It's going to count. Um, so today we have part of the Nevermind team. I was going to say the Nevermind team, but you guys are a big organization and there's only three of you today. So that's part of the things I want to understand what you guys do at Nevermind. Uh, but uh, we, we'll talk about uh, their project, what they're working on, which is Warp. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Warp, Warp is a transpiler from Solidity to Cairo that lets you um, deploy your Solidity code base on StarkNet. So we're going to talk about, uh, about it, uh, maybe see a small demo if Jorik is able to, uh, to, to resuscitate his laptop. And yeah, we're open for questions. Don't hesitate, you can ask the questions in the community calls channel. And that's, so yeah, so that's the plan for today. Let me check if there are questions. Not yet, all good. So let's start. So guys, thank you for joining today. Um, if we can start, I'd be curious to uh, hear a bit more about uh, never mind. Like I know it's a big organization. You guys are doing a lot of stuff on uh, on Starknet. Um, specifically, I think the two projects that come up first are obviously Voyager, the block explorer of Starknet, and Warp, uh, which you guys are working on. 
Um, I'm curious to hear how many people work at Nevermind and how many people are in your team working on work? Um, sure. First, thank you, uh, Ari, for having us on uh, the community call and letting us present about work. Um, Nevermind is quite a big organization. So I think the last count, we had over 130 people, but that is updating constantly. We're growing very fast and we're still actually hiring during this uh, difficult time for a lot of people, um, which is quite nice. Um, our projects range across a broad area within the crypto space. So we write Nevermind Client, which most people are probably familiar with. Uh, we've got a project on Juno, which is doing um, one of the implementations with StartNet. And then we have an auditing team, which works in Cairo and does Cairo audits. Uh, we've also got a formal verification team, which is developing uh, formal verification tools for Cairo. And um, we also do a small, we have a team that's in the metaverse. Uh, so we're quite a, a large organization and we're all very like self-directed and take our favorite projects and run with those. Yeah. Very nice. And how many people work on Warp? Um, I think Guy would be better to answer that. You know the answer? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm just trying to navigate Discord and, <laughs> um, and YouTube. Um, yeah, around about, I would say, um, five or four full-time employees. And then we have around about two, two or three interns um, that sort of rotate in and out of our internship program. So, yeah. Um, Very nice. Can, a, can, a nice. Can, sorry. And can you say a few words about yourself? Uh, yourselves, actually, there's three of you. So yeah, yeah, sure thing. So yeah, I um I work uh, full time on the Warp team. Um, I wasn't uh, very involved in Warp 1.0, uh, but came in um, and uh, worked uh, with the Oregon sophomore too. And uh, our team lead Dom Henderson is not yet um, to finish Warp 2.0. Um, but yeah, uh, just excited to be here. I was the team leader in the Ave Port project and I stepped in on Warp 1 uh, at the start of my time in Nethermind and I joined it around the same time, the same time that Swapno joined, he's now dropped off, so I'll introduce him as well. Um, we have like a background in programming languages and compiler design and so that's why they hired us for the Warp project and we kind of came in the tail end of Warp 1 and then we bootstrapped the start of Warp 2 which then got taken over by Dom Henderson who's the main architect of Warp 2. And um, uh, we then stepped in again near the end to just push things over the line to the deadline. So that's our background with Warp. Nice. Yeah. Um, Swapnil, we can't hurt. You're not connected anymore on Discord. If you want to talk there, you'll need to raise your hand again. Very nice. Um, so we can actually. I, I was gonna ask a question to for you to present a bit warp but we can start with the question from odin kind of trolling i guess but uh is warp a transpiler or compiler i think the broader <laughs> question here is can you, can, can, for those for those who are not very familiar with the term would you could, how could you define a compiler a transpiler the difference between both and 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 yeah all right well a compiler so we've actually had this conversation many times in ten um, yeah, a compiler is actually a system which translates one language to another. Um, this can be a low-level machine language, or it can actually be anything from like uh, like a high-level language or uh, well any other target really. Uh, a transpiler is usually um, a translation from one high-level language to another high-level language, and the reason this distinction is because you usually use a different set of tools for um, achieving this like thing. Um, I would say, but a lot of people would judge me for this, the transpilers are a little easier to write than compilers, um, but uh, that really depends on the target. Um, in our case, we wanted to write a transpiler and we wanted to get as high level as possible out of Cairo to like the highest level Cairo that matched the semantics of, of Solidity. And uh, in a lot of cases, we were successful. Um, but then in a few cases, uh, we do some really, really opaque things in order to make the trans like, translation work. And in that sense, sometimes reading the output feels more like a compiler's output. So honestly, Odin, it's a gray area. I would call it <laughs> a compiler. And I think uh, everyone on the team has a slightly different opinion. Um, cool. Um, could you go a bit into... Um... 
like how did you approach transpiling um solidity to Cairo um, I know you guys took various different routes and where you released recently warp version 2 um, can you present how you guys settled on warp 1 and then how did you move to warp 2 and why is warp 2 kick ass <laughs> uh, sure um, we're actually three versions of warp we have a secret uh, first version or like a Not a point one version, which never made it. We don't it out. talk about it. We don't talk. We about don't it. talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but work one was uh, the idea was that we would try and go through you. So the Solidity compiler has an intermediate representation, which is a language which is slightly lower level than Solidity, which should have been easy to write VMs for or interpreters for uh, if you wanted to run them locally over going to the EVM. Um, and then it transpiles from Yule to EVM. That's the, like, that's the latest pipeline. And what we wanted to do was link in at the Yule phase and then transpile from Yule. And there I've used transpile, but anyway, transpile from Yule to Cairo. Um, But why? Is it, is it easier to transpile from Yule than from Solidity? Yeah, so Solidity, the Solidity compiler already does a lot of defiguring and taking out a lot of um, like semantics that we would have to have written ourselves um, when it's doing a translation from Solidity to Yule. So that makes it a lot uh, easier to work with. And the writing of the transpiler was actually very quick. Like warp one was out in, in record time, in my opinion. Um, the one thing that it... Uh, causes issues with is that uh, whatever steps it takes to remove the semantics from solidity that adds some overhead to a representation in Yule, um, which we might be able to do more efficiently if we're going to Cairo. Um, so, Can you repeat uh, that part, please? Yeah, so if um, the transformations from solidity to Yule might make something which makes sense if you want to represent a concept in Yule that might be implemented by some interpreter nicely. For example, the call data, the semantics uh, of Solidity. But um, then we are transpiling all of this, all of these semantics that have been already encoded in Yule over to Cairo, which added a lot of overhead that we didn't actually need. So um, we could write a more efficient compiler from Solidity to Cairo. And that is where Warp2 comes in. Um, so in particular, we drop call data semantics and um, uh, there's a notion of block scopes in Yule, which meant that all of, uh, all of the blocks which had scopes defined in Yule were being functionalized in Cairo and we've gotten rid of a lot of that. Um, yeah. So work one um, covered a lot of the semantics view. And but the output was infeasible to deploy on StackNet. Um, Why? Because it was like generated programs that were too complex. Yeah, it generated programs that are much too large. Like, yeah, it, actually, the main thing was just file size and the upload uh, overhead that I would have for StackNet. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Warp 2 produces much much smaller output, and um, we'll see that soon with some of the slides that Guy will present. Um, Very nice. Thank you. So for those of you who are on Discord, if you want to see Guy's slides, uh, you can go on the Community Call channel. There's a link to the YouTube um, to the YouTube link, and Guy will present his screen in a sec. Very good. Cool. Is, uh, is it presenting? Yeah, we can see your presentation, and we hear you correctly. Sure, I guess I'm, I'm kind of cheating here. I'm, I'm screen sharing a blog that's going to come out because um, uh, we, we didn't have time to make slides. Alpha. Um, <laughs> but just uh, reiterating on what Yorick um, said about um, Yule, um, just providing like these extra instructions that we then had to transpile. Um, here we just have an example um, in Solidity where we have like a one line function. And um, this would be fairly simple to transpile. Um, But then if, go, if you compile it to Yule and then transpile that, you see it gets like much more complex. Um, I think it goes from one, a one line function to six lines with function calls. So even more lines in those function calls. So you just had the contracts really blow up um, in terms of size. Um, but yeah, so onto Warp2, um, we just have some example contracts here that we've transpiled. Um, uh, 
This one is base jump rate model V2. Um, and basically, you can see that warp two is providing a, um, a contract size that's, uh, I guess, half of warp one, which is cool. Um, it's because a lot of these like high level semantics that are um, represented in Solidity um, are also handled in Cairo. So we can almost go like directly from one to the other. Um, and here we have uh, Open Zeppelin's ERC-20 contract. Um, you can see also um, reduced it by half, um, which is great. Uh, yeah, the warp, warp one contracts were rather large um, and it wasn't great. The handwritten is still obviously more optimized. Obviously generated code will always um, have more lines of code than um, original handwritten. Um, but here onto uh, step count as well. Um, you can see in the blue, we have warp one. More instructions means more steps, basically. Um, and we have, uh, sorry, this is the first contract based jump rate model B2. Um, see warp is providing sort of half the step count for all of these functions. Um, step count is basically analogous to um, efficiency, or I guess I don't want to say gas, but computation. Um, so you can see the, the transpile is generating um, generating um, functions that are much more efficient than warp one, uh, warp two still, I mean, sorry, handwritten still very more, very much more efficient. Um, but the real surprise comes from um, the step counts of the open Zeppelin contracts. You can see warp two does a mm. much better job. Um, yeah, it really reduced it. Um, some, most of these functions over here, so such as name, symbol, total supply, these are just sort of storage variables. You can see warp one had quite a hard time dealing with them, um, but with warp two and the optimizations we built in, um, yeah, it's really it's really reduced it by orders of magnitude. Um, so yeah, those are the two of the um, real cool features about not using um, the Yule intermediary and going direct from Solidity to Cairo. Um, the second benefit, or the I guess you could say the third benefit, is um, we have increased readability for Cairo um, for the transpiled functions. Um, so here we just have an approved function um, from that ERC20 open Zeppelin contract. Um, fairly readable. Obviously, it's Solidity. We all know how to read it. Um, but once transpiled, um, we keep the function names there. We keep the comments there, um, the documentation. Um, the Cairo that's generated is readable. Um, Warp one, this would have exploded. Um, it would be like a lot of lines. Um, but yeah, it makes the it makes um, developing with Warp much more easier and user friendly. And then um, sort of the last thing we threw in as well is are these helpful unsupported feature messages from Swapnel. Um, you know, it, nothing's worse than using a, using a package and uh, you just get a random TypeScript error, and it's not like it doesn't really tell you anything about the tool you're using, just that there's an error in the code. Um, so here we've we've added these um, these unsupported feature messages just so we can guide the sort of developers as they use the tool into knowing what features we do support and don't support. Because um, obviously finding a equivalent from um, Solidity into um, StarkNet um, is quite challenging. So there were there are a few features we don't support yet. Um, but in the future, you know, we, we're working on it. And uh, yeah, there'll be a closer mapping between the two. That's super cool. So something, can you go up a bit uh, in the in the function uh, that is a uh, transpile, please? Um, so there, there's a question in the chat and I'm actually also really interested into, into it. Can you discuss Warp's storage model? Um, can you explain a bit how data is stored in a warp contract? Because I see the functions are, are named the same or there's some prototype that is similar. I see that you wrote some specific warp function, but I think where, which are understandable, I think where is there is something that is very peculiar is for storage. Can you talk a bit about it, please? So. Oops, did you hear me? I'm not sure it's cutting up a bit. Sorry. 
I, I, I think we're losing guy. Ooh, yeah. So I don't know, Jorik, yeah, if you can maybe uh, talk a bit about uh, Warp's storage model. Yes, yes. Um, so the most surprising thing that you'd face with the storage model is that uh, the storage var that you'd have for your storage is actually just one single var. Um, so we don't transpile every single storage var. The reason that we have to do this is because in Solidity you can have references to storage and we'd have to be able to update those references consistently. Um, and um, we looked at a number of different models. Um, so you can have a pointer to a storage var, right, in Solidity. And uh, if you updated this storage like pointer and then updated some value inside it, you have to make sure that all the other references are correct and uh, have the right pointers to the right uh, storage files. And we run into some problems here because the, the most naive way to do it, for example, would be to uh, write some form of enum for every single storage, that, like storage var that you uh, instantiate, and then switch over those when you are accessing a reference to a storage var. Um, this is a bit ugly. So what we've actually done is we've just created one unified storage space, and the entire storage space has indexes, which we use to uh, keep like track of which storage var you're referencing to. This makes the storage model a bit opaque, and uh, one of the arguments for calling it a compiler over transpiler. Um, Interesting. So basically, the were function like the way storage works on Solidity and in Cairo is so different that you had to re-implement a storage model, some kind of on abstraction on top of, uh, of Cairo. Uh, isn't this doesn't this create a lot of overhead when you're? Uh, uh, when... No, this doesn't create a lot of overhead because the compiler is aware of what the indexes are to the various storage models. Um, so it is just a key for accessing the data. We don't actually store more data than is required. So they're quite similar in performance. Now where this, actually, uh, sorry. Yeah. It's actually quite similar to how similarly when it compares the Yule and then how it has- You're, the you're muted on Discord, sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so how warp storage model works is actually quite similar to how when similarly compile the Yule the, the storage model, how it handles that is quite similar. So that's also a part of inspiration. Oh, really interesting. Yes, uh, so this is another layer where you get two levels of abstraction on top of each other. The UO was implementing its own storage model, and then we would have to then write a translation from that to the Cairo storage model. And that was causing us a lot of overhead as well. Um, so in memory, we have something uh, quite similar. We have like one memory location, um, except for, uh, yeah, no, sorry. Memory is a dict. We just use the dict access model, which is a default from uh, the Cairo package. Um, and that is just a key value store. And we do the same thing. We implement our own, our own memory model. Um, everything which is a basic type gets stored directly into some key value pair there. And if it's a more complex type, we make it a reference to another area of memory. And the reason we do that is for the same reason that we have multiple references to the same memory values. And we need to make sure that those uh, stay um, correct throughout the program. Um, that does add a bit of overhead because now you have like two uh, abstractions um, for referencing some more complex types. But those would be structs and arrays would be slightly slower. Nice. Oh, follow up question by my Sushka. Yep. This model produces non-straightforward Cairo code. Isn't it just a mismatch between what Warp needs and what Cairo storage API provides? Yeah. Um, yeah. The Cairo what it provides is not what we need, so we have to work around it basically. That's the issue. Okay, I'm not sure you heard your answer, but oh well the Cairo model, sorry, that it provides is not enough for what Solidity needs. So Warp has to work around it and make a solution to it. Yeah. Yes, and there are very good reasons why these things are different. Um, the VM that Cairo works over uh, works really, really well for its implementation um, for like the ZK part of this. Um, but uh, referencing, like everything is done with two registers and Cairo works really, really well for that model. Um, it could be raised up to a Solidity-like level, 
but I think Cairo should be free to uh, do some things differently and to experiment with its own models. Um, and so it makes sense to go from Solidity to Cairo and do this transformation step. Thank you. So um, I have a question. Like uh, the first one would be, um, how do you, how would you compare, how would you, would you compare like a theoretical ZK EVM with warp is what do you get in one case? What don't you don't get in one case in the other, and uh, and what are the trade offs? Okay. It's a broad question, right? But it is a broad question. Um, if we take a theoretical ZK EVM, um, you basically have the full EVM implementation, right? So, out of the box, you get almost all of the implementability working if in this space, which is a really nice property, but uh, the the proof system and everything else is now constrained by the constructs of this EVM and the performance is also linked to the implementation of the EVM. So I think it makes sense to go through your own model uh, and to explore maybe better languages that might uh, like reveal the trade-offs between performance for the end user. If we have warp, um, the trade-off here is that we don't implement everything that the EVM would support. And there are certain differences that are as a result of Cairo having a different like semantic representation and the translation doesn't make sense. And there are a few where it just got so prohibitively uh, like costly that it didn't really make sense to do. Um, and there's also and, a difference in the way the two networks are structured, right? I mean, there are some exactly. concepts at the network level that don't map from Ethereum to Starknet and the other way around. Absolutely, absolutely. So I I actually think that having something like warp uh, allows the target more flexibility in the sense that like um, uh, Starknet does not need to be EVM compatible and I can choose different network uh, like configurations and, and systems and that uh, we can very clearly show to the end user which constructs from Solidity work very well uh, and that they can um, modify their code accordingly. And to be honest, the majority of things work very well out of the box. So this doesn't seem like a huge effort to change your code over if you have a large Solidity code base and then to try and warp it. Warp is very helpful in this. It will tell you exactly which features are unsupported. And uh, usually it's, it's just a simple matter of deleting a few lines here or there. Um, Super. I'm very, I'm very eager to see people using Warp. I think it's a great tool to onboard uh, people who have a Solidity code base and want to be able to deploy it to Starknet. Um, who do you think Warp is for and who is it not for? Yeah, um, Warp can be for projects that want to very quickly prototype on Starknet. And you can, if you already have a large Solidity code base, it's really worth just trying to warp the whole thing, see what works, what doesn't work, and then patching it up so that it deploys on Starknet. Um, that is pretty incredible, uh, considering how much time it could save you. Um, it's really useful as well if you are writing in low-level Cairo because you want to be as efficient as possible, for example. That's another difference between having an EVM-compatible language and using Warp. Uh, you can handle the efficiencies better if you're like in a, um, if you're not going through a complex transpiler like, like Warp. Um, yeah, uh, you could, for example, leverage any Solidity libraries that are out there and just warp them. And then you would have all the functionality of libraries that have already been written within the yeah, Wait, space. but if you do that, you mean you could take a library in Solidity, warp it in Cairo, and then use it from a Cairo contract? Yes, you could. Ah, that's pretty cool. So it would basically save you the time to re-implement the library in Cairo. You would probably lose a bit in performances, but you get the speed of experimenting with it. And if at some point you need to make it better, you can re-implement. Yeah. Absolutely. For example, um, I think we use Ray and WordMath a lot in the Ave project. And I have written a handwritten implementation uh, myself. And then I warped it a couple of weeks later when work was ready. And I would have saved myself all that time. It would work perfectly. So, um, Cool. Yeah. So if you have a Solidity code base, uh, it's good to use it. If you want to experiment with some Solidity libraries that are not on Cairo, it's a good thing. Who is Cairo, uh, Warp not for? Um, 
Warp is probably not for a Sleuthy maximalist. <laughs> if you want every concept in Sleuthy, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, Warp will also lag behind the uh, Cairo implementation, the small bit, all the time, which is not a huge issue and is probably not going to impact most people. But if you want to use the absolute latest and greatest out of Cairo, then stick to Cairo. And um, there are a lot of developments in like the Starkware space. So uh, it's not for you if you want to just write a Cairo project um, like from start to finish. Yeah, I'm not really sure who it's not for. It's just for those who want to use it, I guess. <laughs> Um, I don't see any major drawbacks. Uh, if your Solidity is already really heavy and has a huge overhead, um, it might be a severe bottleneck to try and warp that. But um, I think it still remains to be seen in the wild what the, like, what the performance is on, on really big projects. And we're really excited to find out. So please try it and let us know. Uh, one more to point out to that. Warp is also for new developers who don't want to like, delve into Cairo. This is not a non-trivial language. Uh, if you can just do the subset of Solidity that Warp supports, then Warp is for you. Cool. Yeah. So if you want to start Star, uh, to try Starknet easily, don't want to start a new language, then you can use uh, Warp. Amazing. Um, so Masyushka is asking, I hope I say his name right. What about correctness of the transpilation process? How are you going to ensure output Cairo is equivalent to input solidity? It's a, yeah, basically the way I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's a weird analogy, but the way compilation works is kind of like when you have a product ID and you get execs, executives asking devs to implement it, right? So it's from high level <laughs> to low level. Transpilation is some executives asking other executives to ask their devs to do something. So this part, like uh, having executives talk with executive and be able to transpile it uh, to, to pass the message correctly down can be challenging, obviously. Um, uh, weird analogy, but anyway. About the correctness. So this is something that we were, like, most of our testing is based for this. So there's something called the semantic test in the Solidity repo, which is the compiler. And, and test each bit of semantics for the smallest construct. So there'll be like one for message dot, uh, message dot, uh, what's the one, uh, message of signature, and like the smallest features you can think of, if, else, while, loops, anything. There'll be a small test file that will say the inputs and the outputs that is expected for that bit of solidity code. We take that solidity code, we transpile it, we send the feed, we feed it the same input, and we expect the same output. That's our major way of testing if warp is correct. Warp is also being audited right now, so hopefully that will also add some more guarantees there. But that's a way of making sure that Warp transpires it correctly. So basically, a whole lot of testing. How many tests do you guys have for Warp? So depending on how you count the test, like you count each function as a test, you count one file as a test. Let's say you count one file as a test. I'd say there are about a thousand tests, at least, tests. Yeah. Decent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it take long as well for us. Very nice. It's... Yeah, no, go ahead, Jory. Oh, I was going to say, for those who are curious, the definition of correctness is that for all of the inputs that um, a function receives, uh, you will get the same outputs from the transpiled result and from the original result. Um, and so it is very important that all of the, this, this is kind of interesting in this space because the inputs in Cairo and the inputs in Solidity are fundamentally different, right? We have the felt type versus like Solidity's U and some ints and so on. And um, the way that we restrict the space is that every function call will do a runtime check to make sure that those uh, values are within the bounds expected uh, and represented in their felt form. And then we run the test. So we also test quite heavily the inputs and the outputs of uh, function calls. Well, like the input transformation of function calls to make sure that we don't end up putting wrong inputs in and getting behavior we're not expecting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just an extra little piece of the puzzle. Very cool. So you guys released recently Warp 2. Um, my question, my following question is, what's next? 
Right. So should we wait for uh, Warp Three or what's the <laughs> what's the next? Uh, what are you guys working on? What was the next step for Warp? Um, a lot of work is now being put into exploring how we can integrate Warp into already existing Solidity tooling. It'd be nice if we could just use your own tool like Hard Hat and Brownie or whatever, and Warp just work for that. So there's a lot of work. There's another, another team looking into that. There's work going to be done into looking at writing tutorials and a bit of marketing so that people can onboard to it easily. And then there's obviously also work into making it efficient and making it more footage complete. So there's already work being done on uh, decreasing the size of the unsupported feature list, basically. Nice. Yeah. If you check out the work repo, you'll see the list of unsupported features, and then you'll see question marks from those that are being worked on, and um, little hammers on those that are being currently worked on, as in like being implemented at the moment. And then uh, big red X's, so you know those ones are not coming. Um, there will not be a warp three um, because there aren't any real fundamental shifts that can still be taken unless Solidity changes drastically or Cairo changes drastically. Um, so there might be a warp three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then there might be a warp three. <laughs> right. But okay, understood. My, I guess my question was really geared towards. Um, I mean, having a language that is easy to use, such as Solidity, because it's well documented and everything is nice. Uh, I've, I've gone to realize that the big mode of Solidity is not necessarily just the language, it's the integration with all the tooling, just like you mentioned, Swap Neil. And cool. um, I'm really curious. Um, I, I'm curious about how uh, it would be great if it were possible to, you know, just use your R hat project in Solidity and just change the endpoint and say, yeah, I deploy to StarkNet and then in the background have a warp running to transpile it and deploy it. Yeah, so a, we have a team of two or three people right now looking at just into those, just integrations with other tools. Um, hopefully, the UX will be that smooth. Hopefully, this UX will just be you add target, start net, main net, alpha, whatever you want, and that should just work out of the box. Uh, it's not going to be some hiccups, but hopefully not too many. Well, I guess you're going to need also like an RPC tra translator, right? Not a transpiler, mm -hmm. but a translator because you don't use the same the the same main points and you don't use them the same way between Starknet and uh, mm -hmm. and, and and Ethereum. Yeah, so we hopefully we'll collaborate with the tool writers themselves. Hopefully, to fix all those bits. Awesome, um, guys. I think I've asked most of the questions I have. So, people in the audience, if you want to ask a question, either on YouTube or on Discord feel free to do so. So there's a bunch of people saying hi on YouTube. Hello, nice to have you here. Um, and there's a bunch of people listening on uh, on Discord. So very nice to have uh, all of you here also. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna ask, uh, gonna, while we're waiting, I'm gonna ask a question that is, uh, it's hard to, for me to rephrase it exactly, but recently somebody asked me, oh, but, Prove so. Wait, when you write Cairo code, you can generate a proof for the code. How is this different than formal verification? You mentioned earlier that you guys uh, work on formal verification uh, and that you have formal verification. You're working on formal verification for Cairo. The way I answered was like formal verification is to conceptually prove that your program is sound. Provable computing is to show that n execution of a program sound or not is is correct, but it's like it, it is fun because uh, for both we kind of generate a proof to prove that it's correct. How would you uh, how how would you define uh, both and how are they complementary? I don't know if you guys work on ver on 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 formal <laughs> verification. Maybe that's a that's a, that's a good question, but. I think an, an analogy here might help, right? So when, let's say you're writing a program on StarkNet which calculates Factorio. When you submit that to StarkNet, the StarkNet proof is not checking if this actually produces Factorio. It's checking if this is a valid, it produces a valid state transaction, uh, transition. Whereas you might formally verify and write a model that does checking specifically for Factorio. Uh, so basically the goal here would be different. The goal of StarkNet is to check if you're doing a provable correct state transition and in case of formal verification for your protocol or something, we're checking if the liquidity stays as it should or something like that. 
I think it's a bit of an unfair question, Ari, because you answered it like perfectly. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say there's, a, um, there, there's like different properties about something which you wish to prove, and each one requires a different proof system for it. Uh, and so that is what is happening here. We're, we're layering proof systems on top of each other to get behavior that you would expect. So we want to say the property is that this is. Um, there is integrity in our computation, then we generate a proof of the execution of the program, and then we get the property integrity out of it. If you want to say that the, compu the computation does what you thought that it should do, which is the specification, then you use formal verification to write a model of what the outputs should be in relation to the inputs in some sense, or the behavior of the system, like it always terminates, which is almost possible as the only way. Like there's some like subset of like behavior that you wish to prove. And then you run, um, you write your statements in one language, and then it takes statements in your uh, target language and sees, do all these statements together have the property that we expected, right? And then, um, so in this case, it's the model that you have, and then uh, like um, like Cairo as a language is the statements that you're checking it against. Um, in the proving case of integrity, your model is actually the Cairo program, and the proof is uh, over the statements of the trace of the execution of the program, right? Um, so those are the same thing. And the same way you have uh, type systems, type systems just say that the data that you're operating over is what you expect it to be. Um, and it's much deeper than that, but it's also a form of proof that your program has a particular property that you expect. And so all of these things are um, like, yeah, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're instances of very similar ideas there. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, thank you. Um, all right, uh, I actually have one last question for Warp. Um, can you talk a bit, mm -hmm. so you guys are also working on porting Aave to StartNet, right? Uh, yeah. Aave, AV, depends on how you pronounce it, right? Uh, <laughs> ghost landing protocol, let's say it that way. Uh, so <laughs> so you guys are working on porting Aave to, to StartNet. Um, how did Warp fit into that picture? Um, I know there is some, projects to like, how did you guys approach it? Do we develop new feature? Do we develop new features in Solidity, then warp it? Do we reuse the code base, warp it? Do we rewrite the code base in Cairo? How did you guys uh, approach it? And what were the, like the, um, the requirements from Aave to, to, to have this work uh, soundly? Right. Um, the design phase of Aave, when we were involved, it was actually the phase one, which is not the full implementation of Aave. It's a much smaller, um, it's a much smaller project compared to like uh, the Aave protocol in total. Uh, at the time when we were writing this, Warp 1 was the only thing that was available, and it was not actually feasible to use Warp 2 yet because it just didn't produce any useful output. So in our work with it, um, what we wanted was Warp to be ready, but we just, but this wasn't the reality. So it didn't actually feature in our implementation phase at all. Um, but retrospectively, uh, as I mentioned before, I went through a couple of libraries that we used and worked them and realized I would have saved myself uh, a lot of time. So I kind of wish that we had had Warp when we had done that. Um, now with the second Ave phase, Swap and I are not actually involved with it anymore. Um, but I think that they are going to do a Cairo implementation from the ground up. And the reason being is that they need to ensure that there's auditability of the output code. And what the situation as it is now is that warp isn't audited, right? So um, we make no guarantees about what the output of your code is. Um, no official ones. Uh, I think it's pretty good, but yeah. Um, so uh, it means that the Avid project can't rely on the output of work yet to say, yes, this is good enough for us to deploy. And auditing what comes out of Warp um, could be quite tricky if they also need to audit the memory model and the storage model, which you would get for free once the Warp audit is finished, right? So then the auditors would say, well, we trusted Warp, like the storage and memory model, this is correct. And now we just check the implementation details that are uh, in the functions themselves in Cairo. That's one example. Um, 
But I think what's happening at the moment is that we have a bunch of interns looking at some of the submodules in the AVE project that um, might be quick to work on, and we're giving them as like practice to the projects while we're working out the full design of AVE phase two. And what we've uh, had one or two interns do is just warp them to see what their equivalent Cairo would look like. Um, and so it's good for exploring and seeing like how like equivalent Cairo might look. Uh, because it's not that far off in a lot of cases. Um, so I could even see a situation where you could warp something that's like um, not like really complex to implement, but might take you a long time to transpile over to Cairo by hand and then just going through it and editing it out um, to uh, like a really clean handwritten version, um, which one of our interns did, and it produced a really nice result. Now, it's not necessary because uh, they're almost equivalent, um, but it is a good way to get like just get into your solidity contracts uh, on the Cairo side. So, yeah. Um, I don't, Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So we will not be using work for the same reason uh, as we didn't do it in the AVE phase one, which is that we don't have an audited output. But uh, I really wish that we could have, because I think it would have saved us a lot of time. Maybe for uh, the next phase of AVE, who knows? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> cool. All right, guys. Um, we are 15 minutes into our call. I think we covered most of the question I have. Is there any points you wish we'd mentioned? No, I just, uh, please try it out and let us know what works and what doesn't. How do we find it? So you can find it on the GitHub repo, which you can link in the Discord as well. Um, so it's HTTP two points slash slash no, GitHub. Dot... HTTP I'm kidding, I'm posting it in the community call. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so I posted it on Discord in the community call channel. I'm actually going to put it in the chat also on YouTube Live so that people can go on the repo. Never mind, it's warp. And yeah, all right, guys. Look, thanks again for uh, attending uh, our community call and presenting. Really excited to see what people um, come up with warp. We are we're not working right now on it, but we do plan on having a warp tutorial out soon so uh do keep an eye on that uh, on, on that also um yeah and in the meanwhile uh yeah <laughs> thank you for your work and uh you, happy to talk more once you guys have uh, more integration with tools and stuff like that great thank you for having us very cool and for all of you listening to the community call on youtube on discord thanks for attending um i hope you learned something today and yeah, next time we meet is not in two weeks because there's going to be each CC week in Paris. So I hope I'll see a lot of you around to eat good stuff and uh, listen to interesting talks. Jorik and, and Sofnil, will you be around? I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry? Unfortunately, I can't come. Yeah. You're lost. Yeah. I know. I'm a question mark because of uh, personal reasons, but Guy McComb will be there, and so will Greg, who's also worked on the project, and um, one other person in the group. So, yeah, there will be another many people around, and definitely come and talk to us. Amazing. Super cool. So, there's not going to be a call on the week of, like, on it should have been on um, Tuesday 19th, so next call is going to be on Tuesday 26th. So we're going to have, uh, and this time we're going to talk about full nodes. So thanks everyone for attending and have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.